as Beth said, I understand that many of you are just back from your spring break and uh, she suggested that perhaps the reason you're here is because classes have not started yet. So I guess you're here because there is nothing better to do in Beijing today. <laughs> so I'll try to be good entertainment uh, as best as I can. Um, I have very fond memories of my University of Chicago days. I remember two things in particular. One was the cold, it was bitterly cold. And the second was the sheer intellectual stimulation. And I think the two were sort of connected because it was so cold that the best thing you could do is hang out at the library and read. Um, so in a sense, I think they sort of reinforced each other. But it was really a wonderful place to study economics. And uh, I benefited very greatly from my time there. And I owe much to the University of Chicago um, for uh, my career. What I plan to talk about today um, is the Renminbi's role in the global economy. As uh, um, Beth pointed out, this is also technically the launch event for my book on emerging markets, um, uh, or at least the Chinese version of that book, because the book was actually published about a year ago, and it sort of fits into the overall theme about emerging markets and their role in the world economy, with, of course, China playing the most prominent role. So what the book basically argues is that the emerging markets did very well during the global financial crisis relative to the advanced economies. But you have all seen that, and especially in China that is the case. But the more interesting question is why did they do well? So in the book, uh, my co-author Ihan Kose um, and I try to understand what it is that made the emerging markets much more resilient to the global financial turmoil. And what we basically conclude is that the emerging markets learned the lessons that the advanced economies had been telling them for a long time. Run good policies, be careful about your public debt levels, make sure that your monetary policy is good so that you have room to respond if you get hit with shocks, make your labor markets more flexible, don't take on too much debt. So we've seen this very interesting role reversal um, in uh, the global economy. In fact, there was a paper that I did last year characterizing certain aspects of this role reversal. What we see now in the world economy is an enormous amount of instability coming from the advanced economies, which are building up massive amounts of debt. In fact, I did some calculations based on IMF data suggesting that if you look at the overall global public debt accumulation, this is the debt of uh, central governments, from the period from 2007 to 2011, advanced economies accounted for nearly 90% of the increase in global debt, while emerging markets accounted for about two-thirds of global GDP growth. If you take the IMF forecast seriously, from 2011 to 2016, emerging markets will account for about 55% of world growth. These are in uh, market exchange rates, so these are nominal numbers and they will account emerging markets that is for about 15% of debt accumulation. Advanced economies will account for the other 85%. So there is this fairly serious concern about the instability coming from the advanced economies which emerging markets need to cope with and to prepare themselves for. And that I think is going to be the challenge for emerging markets. It's not the case that they are completely insulated there is this notion of decoupling with the emerging markets and advanced economies sort of having broken away from each other. In the financial markets, this is clearly not true. What happens in New York affects what happens in Shanghai, but interestingly, what happens on the Shanghai Stock Exchange now equally affects what's happening on the New York Stock Exchange on NASDAQ. So the financial market linkages are much stronger. But the um, real part of the economy the emerging markets are doing a lot better. And my sense is that this bifurcation is going to remain with the uh, emerging markets generally delivering much better growth prospects in the future. Although, of course, if there is a big cataclysm in Europe, for instance, it is going to hurt the emerging markets as well. But most emerging markets have built up a lot of policy space. Um, China is a very good example of this. If a crisis were to hit, the amount of debt in China, especially explicit debt is relatively low, although if you add in contingent liabilities and uh, local government debt, the number is higher. But still, 
much lower than that of the advanced economies. And on monetary policy as well, there is a lot more room to move. But with the advanced economies, there really is very little room to move. If you think about the amount of debt in the US, it's already a staggering amount. Gross debt is about 90% of GDP, and it's expected under current policies to rise to about 110% of GDP. So those numbers are quite scary. So in this context, of course, one of the critical issues is the role played by currencies. Now, what happened during the global financial crisis was an enormous paradox in international finance, and it's something we haven't seen before. What has happened in the past is when an economy has its financial system imploding, everybody goes for the exits. Domestic investors, foreign investors, all try to get out the door because the economy is sort of falling apart if the financial system is falling apart. So what happened in 2008, 2009? Of course, the US was at the epicenter of the financial crisis. You had the US housing market meltdown becoming a much broader financial market meltdown, which then started affecting the rest of the world. So what should have happened? Money flowing out of the US. What happened? Money surged back into the US. And this was an astounding paradox at one level, that the country that was at the epicenter of the financial crisis had money coming in. And the reason for that, of course, is because the rest of the world looks even less safe than the US. The US has one trump card, which is the enormous debt of its financial markets. And despite all the problems the US has faced, it still has very liquid financial markets, very deep and broad financial markets. And that trump card is a really important one. But this has, of course, created a lot more thinking about the international monetary system. Does it make any sense to have so much dependence on a currency, the US dollar, um, and to have a situation where when the US economy and the US financial system are not doing so well, people have nowhere else to go. Of course, the euro was expected to be a contender for an alternative to the dollar. And the euro in its initial years actually did quite well. Um, if you look at the overall share of foreign exchange reserves held in different currencies, um, in the early years of the introduction of the euro, what happened is that the dollar share fell from about 70% to about 61%. Most of the difference was made up for by the euro. These days, the euro doesn't look so good. So what's left? There is the Japanese yen. And the J Japanese yen, of course, can take on some of the burden of adjustment, but it's hard for the Japanese. They've had zero nominal GDP growth over the last two decades. Um, it's not an economy that can cope very well with more exchange rate appreciation. So what's left? The British pound, the Swiss franc. The UK doesn't look that great. The Swiss franc did appreciate a significant extent, but again, it's a small country. They can't take on that much of the burden of appreciation. So this topic has become introduced into the debate. What is the right alternative? And of course, as one looks around the um, global economic landscape, there is one country that's very difficult to ignore, the country we are in right now, China. So there has been a lot of talk about what role the renminbi is going to play in the global monetary system. And this is something that I think has become to some extent overblown. In the US, there are two views about China which get a lot of attention. One view is that China is taking over the world, the renminbi is taking over the world financial system, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. The other view is that China is about to collapse. Now, there are all sorts of problems in China. You can point to the banking system. You can point to other parts of the economy that are not working so well. So it's going to be all doom and gloom. So I like to be boring on this issue, to end up somewhere in the middle, which I think is where the reality lies. So this report that I did with one of my graduate students, um, uh, who's actually uh, from mainland China himself, uh, Lei Ye, um, we tried to understand better what is happening in terms of the internationalization process of the renminbi. Now this word 
internationalization is thrown around a lot. So what we do, or what I thought is very important to do right up front, is to be very clear about concepts. Um, because there is a lot of confusion about what exactly it means for the renminbi to become an international currency. So I like to think of three different concepts that are relevant here. One is an international currency, a currency that is used in international trade and finance transactions, where countries are willing to settle their trade transactions um, or think about doing investment in each other in that currency. So that's an international currency. The second issue is that of a convertible currency, one where the capital account is quite open, so that capital can move relatively freely across national borders. Now, neither of these is necessary or sufficient for the other. Usually, they tend to go together. Currencies that are convertible tend to be ones that also have an international role, but it's not necessary. The third concept is what gets thought of a lot more, which is the reserve currency. And for a currency to be a reserve currency, the first two conditions have to be met. The currency must be reasonably well accepted internationally, and the currency must be quite convertible. So there are these three steps we need to think about before we can think about the renminbi's role in the world economy. So let's break it down and see what is happening in each of these dimensions. Now, there has been a lot of attention on China's capital account liberalization process. And here, in fact, there has been progress. Um, now, in principle, there are lots of controls on the books in China, both in terms of inflows and outflows of capital. But these have progressively become reduced over time, partly due to policy measures, and partly because of the fact that the economy is more open to trade, is more open to finance, so it's harder to control the flow of capital. If one thinks about the amount of reserves that China accumulated in the last few years, it's good to have reserves, but having $3.2 trillion of reserves sounds good, but it's a major headache to manage. China doesn't necessarily want this level of reserves, but the capital has been coming in in order to take advantage of what is presumed to be pressures for the renminbi to appreciate. So the capital account has become more open in de facto terms over time. And what I think the Chinese government is doing is basically trying to use this process of de facto opening to its advantage. And this is where the internationalization process comes in. And of course, you've all heard, we've all heard about how much China has accomplished on this front already, especially using Hong Kong as an offshore center. There is increasing amount of trade settlement in renminbi through Hong Kong. Um, renminbi denominated deposits can now be offered by Hong Kong banks, even by Chinese banks operating in New York, and there's a lot of um, interest in New York in going and uh, opening renminbi deposits just because it's a cool thing to do, to say you have a renminbi account. Um, in addition, there is more remittance of renminbi for settling these transactions. So all of these steps are beginning to gain traction. And if you look at the amounts involved and you plot them on a chart, all the trajectories look like this. And you say, wow. But of course, you're starting from zero on many of these things. And all of the trajectory is like this, and in some cases it's quite impressive. One should not make too much of these moves yet, because to a significant extent they are symbolic. Now the symbolism is quite important, because it signals, first of all, that the Chinese government wants this to happen, and second, there are people who are willing to see this happen. But here again one has to be very careful about understanding what the data are telling us. If you look at trade settlement, for instance, um, China, of course, trades a lot internationally. And right now, about 8% of Chinese trade is settled in renminbi through Hong Kong. Seems like a pretty large amount. But you break down this number, it turns out that most of the settlement is actually coming on the import side, not on the export side. What is going on? Essentially, 
when Chinese um, import, um, or when mainland China imports, um, the people on the other side are willing to accept renminbi in payment. In fact, they're happy to take renminbi as payment. Why? Because it's one way of taking a long position on the renminbi um, in anticipation of the renminbi appreciating. Exporters, on the other hand, find it very difficult to get those who are paying uh, them to pay in renminbi. Why? Because people on the other side don't want to give up their renminbi. So if you start looking at these issues in a more fine, granular way, you realize that, in fact, one shouldn't make too much of these internationalization moves because there might be different objectives that are guiding them. Likewise, if you look at um, the issuance of renminbi denominated bonds, of course there is a lot of excitement about McDonald's issuing a renminbi denominated bond on the mainland. If you look at the volume of renminbi bond um, issuance in Hong Kong, a lot of it is still by mainland companies rather than companies in um, uh, other uh, regions uh, around Asia. So one should not make too much of these internationalization moves. But there is one aspect which above all I think signals the future of the NNB. And this to me is quite a staggering uh, development which is the number of central banks in the Asian region in particular but not just in the Asian region, in other parts of the world as far away as Chile, as uh, far away as Pakistan, um, Brazil, that they're all setting up local currency swap lines with the People's Bank of China, the PBOC. Now this is sort of remarkable that these currency lines are being set up in local currencies. During the global financial crisis, many countries, central banks, went to the US Federal Reserve, or the Bank of Japan, or the ECB, and said, please give me a credit line. So South Korea went to the Fed and said to the US Fed, please give me a credit line because I'm finding it difficult to get dollars, my traders find it difficult to get dollars, and we need dollars. It looks like some central banks are now willing to tell the PBOC, we want this, an arrangement with you where if we run into liquidity problems, we get renminbi, not dollars. Now, of course, a lot of this is because these countries have trade relationships with China, so they want to be able to settle trade transactions in renminbi. But it's a very important development in the sense that central banks are now willing to think about holding renminbi as a sort of line of insurance. And even more remarkably, and this is remarkable because the Chinese currency is still not convertible. So technically a convertible currency is necessary for it to be considered a reserve currency by the IMF. But yet, many central banks, Chile, um, Nigeria, Malaysia, are beginning to hold renminbi as part of their central bank reserve portfolios. Now this is again striking because the IMF says, fine, you can hold renminbi, but we are not going to count these as reserves. Now the central banks admittedly hold very small portions of reserves in renminbi, but their view is, I don't care what the IMF says. What I care about is what the market thinks. And if the market says, if your reserves are in renminbi, those are good enough for me to have confidence in you. Then the game is sort of won. And so in that sense, there really is some fundamental shift going on. We are at the beginning of it, and I think it's going to take a very long time. Um, I don't think this is going to happen in any short period because of lots of constraints in China itself, but the process has started. And it started, I think, in a very, uh, in a way that uh, presages a very fundamental shift. So the internationalization process is going on. The capital account is slowly becoming more open. Now what about the reserve currency status? Now if one thinks about what it takes to become a reserve currency, some have argued that size is very important. Size in terms of a country's GDP, size in terms of how much of world trade is accounted for by a country. And yes, by those measures, China is pretty important. China now accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of world GDP, depending on what exchange rates you use. It accounts for about 9 to 10 percent of world trade, again, depending on what measure you use. 
and last year it accounted for about a quarter of world GDP growth. Pretty impressive numbers. But size is important but not crucial. If you think about the Swiss franc, Switzerland, beautiful country, but it's not exactly uh, a mammoth juggernaut in the world economic system, but they have a reserve currency. Why is that? We'll come back to that in a second. So size helps. Um, having an open capital account is important. Without that, it's very hard to become a reserve currency because you need to be able to uh, convert your currency into other currencies relatively freely. Typically, you need a flexible exchange rate. So all of these are important criteria. And then, of course, macroeconomic policies. Domestic investors and foreign investors must have faith that the value of your currency is not going to erode. And by that dimension, China looks a lot better than the advanced economies. If you look at the level of debt in China, public debt is much lower than the advanced economies. Explicit public debt at the central government level is about 17% of GDP, and the deficit is basically zero. Far better than any of the major advanced economies. If you look at inflation volatility over the last 10 years, it's been somewhat higher than in the advanced economies, but not that much higher. So macroeconomic policies, China looks OK. But then we come to what is the critical determinant. And this is why the Swiss have a reserve currency. And that's financial market development. Because what is critical for a reserve currency is not only that the capital account be open, but also that foreign investors, private investors, central banks, institutional investors, have something to hold on to in that currency. And this is where China still lags behind. If you think about the level of debt, as I said, public debt is very limited. And that's a good thing from the macroeconomic perspective. But why is the US such a strong currency? Because the US has a lot of debt. And this, in a sense, is why the US, again, somewhat paradoxically, is becoming even stronger. Why? Because they're providing more debt. Um, so the world wants dollar-denominated instruments to hold on to, and the US is providing it. And the world community seems to have this childlike faith that the US will do the right thing, that the value of the currency will not be eroded. It's a very fragile equilibrium, because once people start getting concerned about the US dollar's um, value, about whether the public debt level is sustainable, you could have a problem. Um, in China's case, the government bond market is relatively underdeveloped and uh, illiquid. And equally importantly, the corporate bond market is relatively non-existent. So if you don't have public debt, at least you have good corporations issuing debt. That gives foreign investors something to hold on to. And in China's case, you don't have that as well. So I think if one wants to look at the Chinese capital account liberalization process, this is going to be the critical determinant of what happens with China's reserve currency status. Because right now, despite all the other attributes that China has in terms of the heft of its economy, its importance in world trade, its good macroeconomic policies, again, relatively speaking, all of this is important. But if you don't have financial market development to back it up, it isn't going to happen. And this, of course, is not a process that can be engineered overnight. It's going to take a while. But this is where the whole capital account liberalization issue gets tied in with domestic reforms. And the domestic reforms are really going to be the important ones. So if one thinks about exchange rate flexibility, if one thinks about financial market development, these are important things for China to do for its own purposes. If you think about the objectives laid out, in the 12th five-year plan that was presented last year. The notion is of uh, providing better growth, higher quality growth, not necessarily higher growth, but better growth in terms of providing more benefits to the average citizen, in terms of making that growth sustainable, uh, both in terms of the growth process itself, but also in terms of environmental sustainability and uh, uh, related issues of resource use. For all that, you need a financial system that works better. And exchange rate flexibility, again, is helpful for that. So the sequencing issue is really an important one. 
Now, other countries in the past have faced crises because they opened up the capital account too quickly without taking care of these things domestically. They took on large amounts of debt. They didn't tell up the currency to be flexible. Um, they didn't have well-developed financial markets. So a lot of capital flew in. And because financial markets were not good, this capital got misallocated. And then the capital flew out when there were concerns. In China, my view is that the risks are much lower. Why is this? Because again, China, like many other emerging markets, has learned the right lessons. The amount of external debt is very low. Um, it's just about uh, uh, in low single digits. Um, second, China has $3.2 trillion worth of reserves. And that's a pretty good amount of insurance. So even if capital stopped coming in, or even some capital flew out, it would not be such a big deal. It would cause some disruption, but not really a collapse. But this is the framework I think it should be seen in. Um, and I'll come back to this issue um, at the end of the talk. So let me touch upon two other issues now that I've laid out the frame for China's capital account liberalization process. I think it's proceeding gradually. And my sense is that the government is approaching this to a reasonable extent in the right way not letting capital account liberalization get ahead of the domestic reforms, especially exchange rate flexibility and, most importantly, financial market development. Now, there's been talk about the renminbi becoming a part of the IMF's SDR basket, or the special drawing rights. So that's a very select group of currencies. It's a small group of the key reserve currencies. President Nicolas Sarkozy at the last G20 meeting said, um, in his way, and he always thumbs the table when he says these things. He says um, that the yuan should take its rightful place on the international economic stage. The yuan should uh, become a part of the SDR basket. And I was at this meeting in Nanjing where he actually uh, initially made these statements. And um, Chinese officials, the um, uh, governor of the PBC, PBOC, um, Governor Zhou, and uh, um, Mr. Yi Gang of uh, SAFE, they were both much more circumspect, saying, yes, this all sounds very good, but let's be a little cautious because China is still an underdeveloped country and we don't want to push forward too fast with this thing. So the Chinese are, in a sense, becoming quite circumspect. But the reality right now, as I um, uh, state in the report, is that China doesn't need the IMF that much, but the IMF needs China. Why is this? Because the IMF would like to get China to do certain things, but has absolutely no leverage over China. And if China were to sign on to having its currency become part of the SDR basket, it presumably imposes some sorts of moral obligations on China to listen a little more to the IMF. So I predict that within the next five years, we will see the renminbi becoming part of the SDR basket. The second issue is, is the renminbi going to become a global reserve currency? My sense is that this process has started, and over the next 10 years, China's capital account will become more open, and it will become an important reserve currency. The third issue, which of course gets a lot of attention in Washington, um, a little less so here, is whether the renminbi will take over the dollar's dominant role. There, I think the chances are pretty slim, because again, the US has a head start in terms of financial market development and what are called these network effects. Because the world has been used to using dollars for a long time, a lot of trade, a lot of financial transactions are still denominated in dollars, it's not going to be easy to move away from that. But I think the real trump card again that the US holds is its financial market development, and that I think will be one reason why the Chinese currency uh, progresses a little more slowly. So my sense is that what we will see over the next decade is the renminbi becoming a global reserve currency and eroding, but definitely not displacing the dollar's dominance. So let me wrap up with one final speculative thought, which is, does this whole process make sense for China? Does it make sense for China to be moving forward aggressively with these internationalization steps and trying to promote its currency as a global currency?
like I said, the Chinese government and officials are very circumspect about this. But I have a theory that there is essentially an attempt to use capital account liberalization as a framework for accomplishing what needs to be done domestically. Now, the domestic system, the way it's structured, the way the banks are structured, it actually works very well for a lot of people. Um, and there is a huge bias against reforms because, uh, again, there are many who are doing well right now who stand to lose if there is a big shift in the system. But if the reformers can convince all the um, uh, citizens of China and the state council to buy into this notion of the renminbi becoming a world currency and who can resist you know, having China be strong and having the Chinese currency be strong. Once there is buy into that notion, it forces you to think about what needs to be done domestically in order to make that happen. And more importantly, what needs to be done domestically for it to happen safely. Because if you do capital account opening too rapidly without getting your domestic uh, issue squared up, it could potentially be very risky. So what I think the right way to think about this is that China is using capital account liberalization as a way of getting over the reform paralysis that is set in place because, again, the system works very well for a lot of people domestically. <coughs> But ultimately, I think, and this is something I've come to um, learn in China over time, I've been working on China for about a decade right now, which is not very long by the standards of these things. I know a lot more about China than I did 10 years ago, but I understand a lot less um, because it's uh, an incredibly complex economy and many of the standard paradigms of economics don't seem to work that well here. One can point a lot of inefficiencies and yet, the results are very hard to ignore. Um, so I suspect that the Chinese approach may actually have some um, legitimacy to it and may actually work well given the Chinese um, institutional environment. So as in many other things, I think the Chinese are striking out their own path, creating their own blueprint. So to sum up, I call it capital account liberalization with Chinese characteristics. Thank you. Thank you.